All right, so today we're very pleased to have Alex Subin from uh, University of Nebraska who will tell us about generalized square, D, square knots and a four-dimensional Poincaré conjecture. Thank you. Thanks, Nathan. Um, so um, thank you very much for inviting me. I'm really excited to be here. It's been incredibly productive already. Nathan showed me how to automate a task that up till now I've done tediously by hand. So he just saved me hours and hours of work in a morning, which is great. So I, I want to talk about some joint work with Jeff Meyer um, about a special case of the four-dimensional Poincaré conjecture. And so there's Jeff. He's my collaborator. I really like this picture because this is before Jeff and I started working together. This is at his thesis defense. And you can see I found a square knot in this picture. He was already thinking about square knots many years ago. OK, so the, the motivation, the big question here is, is the S4PC, as I'll uh, abbreviate it, the smooth four-dimensional Poincaré conjecture, namely, if you hand me a smooth four manifold and tell me that it's homotopy equivalent to the standard four sphere, is it in fact diffeomorphic to the standard smooth four sphere? And so this question has been asked in different categories and different dimensions over many years and has uh, basically been solved in every category except for the smooth category in dimension four. It's the last, the last gasp of the generalized Poincaré conjecture. And so it's analog if instead of looking at smooth manifolds, you look at topological manifolds. This was proved by Friedman in 1982 um, and won a Fields Medal. So if we, if we replace diffeomorphic with homeomorphic, it's known to be true. But in general, I think people have no idea whether the smooth version is correct or not. And you know, I'd, I will level with you. I'm a three-dimensional topologist dabbling in four-dimensional topology. And so my big question, my, my inroad here is how can I use three-dimensional techniques, possibly in new ways, to think about Maybe not the smooth four-dimensional Poincaré conjecture in its full generality, because that is a, is a problem of tremendous scope. But maybe I can think about some special cases here. And, and what special cases could I perhaps answer? All right, so a bit of historical context. Um, the way that th this sort of investigation works is that someone comes up with examples and says, oh, these are homotopy four spheres through some maybe algebraic means. It's an interesting construction. And then eventually, down the pipeline, someone proves that they are standard. And so this, these, the manifolds I maybe will talk about began in 1976, the Capel and Shannison spheres, which are constructed by taking some um, three torus bundle with a monodromy map and doing some surgery. But it, it's a fairly simple construction that's dictated by a matrix and produces a lot of examples. So it's a, a rich source of things that could be counterexamples. And so in 1979, Salman Akhlut and Rob Kirby uh, looked at a few of these and, and drew what's called a Kirby diagram for one of these, which they've called sigma sub zero. And the Kirby diagram looks like that. And it you know, could be more, it's rather complicated. It could be more complicated, but um, for, for some of you who don't think about four-dimensional topology, maybe I'll just say a few basic things so that you, you kind of understand the framework and, the, and the, the terminology here. So 1H, 2H, and 3H, that's abbreviation for a one-handle, a two-handle, and a three-handle. So suffice it to say that uh, four-dimensional K-handles uh, can be used as building blocks for Smooth four manifolds are. I know you gave me the nice chalk, but I like to break it into little pieces, and that it's just too pristine. So these are building blocks for smooth four manifolds. Folds, and uh, each K handle is diffeomorphic to a four ball. So set of points in R5 with norm at most one. Uh, but the k parameter tells you how they're glued together. You won't really need to know more than that for the purposes of this talk. But let me say that every smooth four manifold, by the way, all four manifolds will be smooth from this point out, can be built with uh, a single zero handle, Let's say n1 one handles, n2 two handles, 
and N3 three handles, and then finally one four handle. And, and you can think of this in the same way you think about a triangulation. Right? A triangulation is a way to take simple puzzle pieces and put them together to make a complicated space. And somehow these are, you can think of these as being a rough measure of complexity, how many handles we have. And then I'll also remark two more things. So for the purposes of this talk, we really will be concerned with four manifolds with a handle decomposition such that n1 equals 0 and n2 equals n3. So no one handles and the same number of two and three handles for reasons that I, I'll explain in a little bit. Or the other thing is that you can always flip a handle decomposition upside down. You can think of these also as being coming from a Morse function and these are like the index indices of critical points of the Morse function. There's this nice correspondence. Well, take a Morse function, you can flip it upside down, reverse the indices. And so you can switch the 0 to 4 handle, 1 and 3, and 2 handles become 2 handles when you flip. So the point is that, or I can consider handle decompositions with n3 equals 0 and n1 equals n2. So both of these are interesting from the perspective of this talk and everything else I won't worry so much about. OK. So this particular picture has four one handles, seven two handles, and three three handles. So six years later, they, they messed around with this handle decomposition a lot. And just like with triangulation, sometimes you can you know, replace two tetrahedra with one tetrahedra. And there's some moves to simplify handle decompositions. Um, and, and so they were able to simplify this down to this picture. And by the way, maybe I'll make one more note. What's the goal of simplification? Well, the standard S4 can be built with just one zero handle and one four handle, and none of the in-between handles. And so the goal of simplification, if you're trying to show that this particular manifold is the standard S4, well, maybe you can cancel all the handles, and then suddenly you see this, and you know, it, it follows that this is diffeomorphic to standard S4. So they got down to this picture, two one handles and two two handles. And, and they said, well, this is a pretty good counterexample to smooth point Curry conjecture because we can't get any further. We tried really hard. It, it, it simplified kind of somewhat malleable. I mean, it took six years, but they got it to this picture, and then it just seemed to get stuck. OK. What does it have to do with Anders Curtis? That's a great question. Uh, let's see. I can say that right here. The show, sure. So Schoenfleece conjecture is like the equivalent of the Jordan curve theorem in four dimensions. So every smoothly embedded S3 in S4 bounds a smooth four ball. So within the handle decomposition, you can sometimes take like some sublevels or some level sets of the corresponding Morse function, and you might see, for instance, an S3, and it's not clear whether it bounds a smooth four ball. So that that was where, where this is coming from. If you look at the boundary of some of the handles, but not all of them. And then Andrews Curtis conjecture, this is gonna, I don't want to get too far afield here, but I will say that um, so. If x has n1 equals n2 with the parameters over there, so the same number of one handles as two handles, and n3 equals 0, then you can write a balanced presentation of the fundamental group of x with n1 relators. I mean, you can always write a, a presentation with n1 relators and n2 or sorry, n1 generators and n2 relators. In the case of n1 equals n2, this is the same number, so this is called balanced. And if the handle decomposition, decomposition trivializes the presentation, presentation is Andrews Curtis equivalent to the trivial presentation? So you just thicken this uh, to a four 
two-dimensional manifold that's what I can contract. This is a two-dimensional thing. But then you thicken it to the four-dimensional thing. That's, that's one way to think about it, sure. I mean, you, you also just get a presentation for the four-manifold. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's, yes, this is one cells and two cells, and you can think of thickening it and getting a, a presentation for the four-manifold group. And then the other thing to note is that for this example, the presentation you get is this uh, famous one, AB, ABA is BAB. That's the first relator, and A cubed equals B to the fourth is the second relator. And so for those of you who have thought about the Anders Curtis conjecture, that's also believed to be false. And this is the, the um, simplest potential counterexample. This is, this, the length of this presentation is said to be 13 because the length of the relators is 13. Anything smaller is known to satisfy the Anders Curtis conjecture, but this is still unknown. So the hope is that you, know, you could disprove the Anders Curtis conjecture and it might follow that this, this can't be simplified. And I should say, if handle decomposition trivializes without adding extra handles. So um, this is going to skip ahead to the next slide. But, but what was eventually shown is that this is standard smooth S4. It's not a counterexample. But Gomp showed this by adding some extra stuff. So he had to first make it more complicated. The, it's still not known whether this can be simplified kind of without first complicating it. OK, so, so in, a, in another step in this direction, Dave Gabay proved the property R conjecture, which in this context tells us that if I have a handle decomposition of some homotopy S4 with a single two handle and three handle, so N2 equals N3 equals one, then in fact, you can only do this in the standard way. And so here's, here's the GOMP result. So, so in fact, that manifold is diffeomorphic to standard S4, and it fits into a classification involving uh, another infinite family, which Gomp called, let's see, HNK. And so Gomp proved that all of these are standard, and in addition, the kirby ockelot sphere is equal to one of these H-manifolds, where N equals 4 and K equals 1. And then, almost 20 years later, uh, someone Ockelot of uh, took this diagram that Gomp had produced and showed that, in fact, all of these um, capel shannons and spheres are diffeomorphic to S4. And so over a long time, the, the counterexamples were, were kind of knocked out. First, I guess, first this one, and then you know, a, few, a few more after that. And then uh, this big family came in 2010. OK, any questions? What did Donaldson prove? Donaldson proved not, not that they're not an S4, but that there are exotic four manifolds. So there are manifolds which are homeomorphic, but not diffeomorphic. But it's not S4. And then there are also four manifolds that are topologically four manifolds, but admit no smooth structure as well. So there are known to be exotic four manifolds, but there are not exotic ones are homeomorphic, but not diffeomorphic. But it's not known in the case uh, of S4. Yeah, I think the. The smallest exotic pair is like CP2, connects some yeah. two copies of CP2 bar. OK. Good. And so the, the next kind of step in this story, as far as I'm concerned, is this paper in 2010 by Gomp, Charlemagne, and Thompson, where the, I'll go back. So these examples have two one handles and two two handles. They flip these upside down. And so they redrew. HNK in this form with two two handles and two three handles. So one thing that's nice about including uh, three handles instead of one handles is that the three handles can be suppressed. This is simply a two component link. And so these handle decompositions can be encoded entirely with a link diagram. And then you can start to do three dimensional things. And so this is a, a, a huge paper which does lots of different stuff. That's why I said the ellipses there. And then Charlemagne really studied these further and, and gave some further classifications in a 2016 paper, which is where we, um, Jeff and I kind of picked up the problem. All right, so that's, that's the history. Let me give a little bit more background. So uh, let's see, right here. So we call a four manifold geometrically simply connected if it has no one handles. And it's motivated by the fact that if it's geometrically simply connected, then it's simply connected because it has a presentation with no generators. 
All right, an R link is one that generalizes, generalizes property R. So should I, should I do the definition of Dane surgery? Would you like to see that? Go for it. All right, we'll define Jane, Dane surgery. So uh, I start with my favorite knot, say the trefoil. So K is a knot in S3. And the result of Dane surgery on K, uh, or let's say like this, Dane surgery on K is obtained by removing a neighborhood of the knot. So a neighborhood of the knot is homeomorphic to a solid torus. And uh, gluing S1 cross S2 to the three sphere with the neighborhood removed in some other way. And so I cut out a solid torus here. So this is a solid torus. And now I have the exterior of the knot, all of the manifold around the solid torus. And I put it back together. But it turns out there are many ways to put this back together. And so I have to specify how I put it back together. And the way to do that is that I can specify that entirely by telling you where the boundary of a disk, a meridian disk for the solid torus lands. And so maybe I'll map that curve to something like this curve. And if I guessed right, that might even be the zero surgery. I don't, I'm not sure. And so the, the gluing is specified by some rational number. So I, I glue this here with some homeomorphism of the boundary. Um, here's my real favorite example. I take the unknot. So k is equal to the unknot. I, I drill out a neighborhood of the unknot. And what's left is a solid torus. So S3 minus the unknot is a solid torus. Its meridian disk is right there. And now I glue my solid torus back in by mapping the meridian of this to the meridian of that. And what I get is S1 cross D2 union S1 cross D2, where the D2 factors are glued together. So it's just S1 cross D2 glued to D2, which was S1 cross S2. So this is the simplest example of, an, of a one component R link. R link. It is a knot with a Dane surgery to S1 cross S2. Or in general, it's an n component link such that Dane surgery yields the connected sum of n copies of S1 cross S2. So for, here's another very simple example. If I take a two component unlink and do the same process, then uh, I'm doing the zero surgery zero surgery on L yields connected sum of two copies of S1 cross S2. So the, the canonical R links are simply unlinks. And so a natural question is, are these the only ones? And we'll see that the answer is no. OK, so the, I, I'll just call those R links from now on, because it takes a long time to say such that Dane surgery yields the connected sum of n copies of S1 cross S2. But for now and forever, that's what an R link is. OK, so now the, if I take a geometrically simply connected handle decomposition of a homotopy S4, well, the Euler characteristic of a homotopy S4 is I can compute this with an alternating sum of the number of handles. It's 1 minus n1 plus n2 minus n3 plus one, zero handles, one handles, two handles, three handles, four handles. And if this is a homotopy S4, then the other characteristic has to be two. If n1 is equal to zero, then this will imply that n2 is equal to n3. 
And so if you've done anything with Kirby diagrams, what a Kirby diagram really is, it's telling you how to attach two handles. If I have no one handles and some number of two handles, then in fact the Kirby diagram is an R link. And so if I take some sort of geometrically simply connected handle decomposition of a homotopy S4, that gives me an R link. And then conversely, there's some machinery in four-dimensional topology that tells you that I don't need to specify three and four handle attachment whatsoever. So as long as I tell you the two handles, I've basically given you the entire description of the manifold if it has no one handles. All right, so every R link is some set of gluing instructions to build a four manifold, which will denote XL. And, and it turns out this, this correspondence is essentially, uh, you know, a, a bijective one, modulo some sort of moves. But the point is that I can study R links. And if I can say something about R links, then in fact I can say something about GSC homotopy S4s. Yeah. And so now I just want to talk about R links. Okay, so here are the examples. I already showed you the, the unknot and the unlink. And so it, it turns out that this is the notion of, of cancellation. If I see an unknotted unlinked component, that means there's a two handle glued to this, there's some three handle which you don't see, and that two and three handle cancel as a pair. And so I could just, from a four dimensional perspective, this link and this link define the same four manifold, as does this link and this link, and the empty link gives me the standard S4. But here's, here's another one. So I'm going to claim that this two component link is an R link, where one component is the square knot, so it's definitely not the unlink. Um, first I'll show you, you know, a, a construction and then explain why this tells me it's an R link. So if I, if I attach these two components together with a band, it's like this embedded rectangle with uh, its opposite sides on the red and the black, and now I will replace the black with some neighborhood of the union of the band and the two components. So in other words, it, it, I join black to red with a band. And I keep red, and I have a new copy of the black. Well, what is this isotopic to? This is, in fact, isotopic to a two-component unlink. Maybe you can see that. I didn't draw the rest of the pictures, but pull that down, pull that up. The red and the black come apart. And so this is called a handle slide. It's, it's the process by which I replace some component with the band sum of it and another one of the components. And it's a fact from, um, say, surf theory or Kirby calculus that if I, if I take two links and I can relate them by handle slides, in fact, that's just some sort of four-dimensional isotopy of the handle decomposition. I'm, I'm really sliding one handle over the other handle. It doesn't change my four manifold at all. And so this is one of the moves that I should allow for in that correspondence. So it's Oh, I should say diffeomorphic. Well, I, it's true, I understand. Yes. So, so th this is true that their surgeries are, are homeomorphic, but so that this is like a three dimensional statement where homeomorphism is, is diffeomorphism. What I really should have said is that, uh, maybe I'll just write it. So if L is handle slide equivalent to L prime, then their four manifold counterparts, X sub L and X sub prime, are diffeo. So I think you know that this mistake was really made because I was trying to justify that this was an R link. Okay, so I, I, this is something that I'd said already. The equivalent, if there's a sequence of handle slides taking L to L prime. Now there's some weaker notions of equivalent, which also won't change the topology of the corresponding four manifold. So uh, the another operation I might want to do is a, take the disjoint union with an unlink to each side, and now I'm allowed to handle slide. And so this is called stable equivalence. I think of this as stabilizing. And then finally, um, I won't say really much more about this, because it takes us away from three-dimensional stuff. But this is a hop pair. And a hop pair is not as kind of these techniques, because this dotted circle represents a one handle. So I'm adding a one handle and a two handle that cancel, and now I can start to slide. So these are, there are these four dimensional things that are going on in the background. So I have some handle decomposition here. And if I, if I do the stabilization, I'm adding some canceling two and three handle pairs. And if I do the, the hop stabilization, I'm adding canceling one and two handle pairs. And so if I'm only concerned with the diffeomorphism type, surf theory tells me that I should be able to allow to do all of these. And so it turns out that if L and L prime are weakly equivalent, then these manifolds are diffeomorphic. But it's also true that if they're diffeomorphic, 
then the corresponding links must be weakly equivalent by surf theory. <laughs> and, and related to these statements are, are three kind of uh, a family of conjectures. Um, so that, I forget what Kirby problem this is, but the generalized property art conjecture says that the most basic thing could be true. I hand you an ER link, like the one that I showed you, that was handle slide equivalent to an unlink. But you know, maybe that's not true, but it is true if you allow stabilization. And maybe that one's not true, but an even weaker statement is that I'm allowed to stabilize and I'm allowed to add hop pairs. And, and so if you believe that last statement, uh, translated to this language, it's uh, my favorite acronym, the GSCS4PC, the geometrically simply connected smooth four-dimensional Poincaré conjecture. So if you can prove this, then you've, you've really taken a huge chunk out of the S4PC. So, so the way that this kind of happened for, for Jeff and for me was we were trying to disprove the GPRC. Because in the Gomsch, Charlem, and Thompson paper, they said, here's this load of evidence why the GPRC is probably not true. And, and so Jeff and I wrote a paper where we were thinking about uh, gay Kirby trisections of four manifolds and have this program to disprove the GPRC um, using trisections, which is a new way to decompose a four manifold and relates to three dimensional topology in a bunch of different ways. But along the way, we, we realized something that we were excited about even more so was that instead of focusing on the GPRC, we could focus on the weak GPRC. And with that additional freedom to stabilize, we could prove that lots of stuff was, was standard. And so the main theorem is the following. If, if I have a two component R link, and one of my components is what we call a generalized square knot, the connected sum of the P2 torus knot and its mirror image, then in fact, no matter what the other component K is, the four manifold we build here is, is diffeomorphic to standard smooth S4. And so this, this takes care of a huge swath of potential counterexamples in particular. Um, oh, first, I guess it's, we say that the, this knot has weak property 2R. So in, in this Gomsch, Charlem, and Thompson paper, they proved that this was true when Q is the unknot. So that's the only knot for which a statement like this is known previously. And so, it, it, for instance, it, would, it takes down all of these, these families in one fell swoop, which is, it's, it's a different type of result because the way that these arguments go, it's rather ad hoc with a sequence of diagrams. They explicitly show you how to take that and, and kind of manipulate it and do the slides and see a, a standard decomposition that comes out. Ours does not do that. Ours is more of an existence proof. Um, if you see one of these, it has to fall into some category. We can stabilize it a bunch, and then we can simplify it. Okay, so now I want to tell you about how the proof goes. So a, a couple of details. I mentioned that when we do day in surgery, we have to specify the gluing map, which is called the framing. And I wrote a zero on the picture of the unlink that I erased. But it turns out we don't have to worry about the framing at all, because the the you can make an argument about homology that whenever I do surgery, um, well, in this case, by assumption, I have an R link, and I've done surgery on each of my components, and I get connected sum of n copies of S1 cross S2, whose homology is z to the n. And so the, the only way this can happen is if each component was zero framed. So I won't worry about the framing at all. Now, this is an important manifold, uh, which we call it YQ. And so I, I take Q, which I consider as like my parent knot. This is the one that is the generalized square knot. And I do zero surgery on it. I do Dane surgery, drill it out, glue in a meridian. This is some three manifold, which will denote YQ. Why would we do this? Well, I'm, I'm considering this two component link up to isotopy and handle slides. In fact, if, I, if I'm looking in YQ and I'm isotoping my second component K as a knot in that manifold, it might pass through the dual knot to the surgery sum, but that can be realized as a handle slide. The, the point of this bullet is that isotopies in YQ are handle slides and isotopies in S3. And so I can simply do knot theory in YQ instead of focusing on the link in S3, which is great for me. And this is great because it's, there much more is known about Dane surgery on knots than is known about Dane surgery on links precisely because you have to do handle slides. So, so can you remind me, which is Q is the, yeah, that's Q. So I'll write it up here. Q is, well, in the statement of the theorem, Q is TP2 connects sum TP minus to a generalized square knot. 
So I'm essentially fixing Q and then trying to manipulate K. Because what do I know? Well, I have Q union K. And if I do zero surgery on both components, I get connected sum of two copies of S1 cross S2 by the assumption that this is an R link. And so instead of doing both surgeries at once, I can do surgery on Q. And if I do zero surgery on Q, I get this th three manifold Y sub Q. And now I do zero surgery on K as a knot in Y sub Q. And of course, this is a reducible three manifold. So now I'm doing surg reducible surgery in a knot. And there is a lot of machinery we can use to study that knot. Doing reducible surgery in a knot in a three manifold this is a well studied thing. OK. Good. Further questions? All right. One important characteristic of Q is that it's a fibered knot. So let me draw a schematic picture. So F is a maybe a minimal ciphered surface for Q. And I will draw this picture like this. There's F. There's Q on the boundary. And so I can construct the exterior by taking a, some product of this. There's Q. So this is F cross I. And now I glue the top to the bottom by some map phi, which we call the monodromy. And I didn't write this on the slide, but we also require that the restriction of phi to the boundary is equal to the identity. And so this is the definition of a fibered knot. And you can see that I have some weird spacing in there. It's because more words are going to fill in when I press this arrow. I can extend this vibration to a vibration of y sub q. So solid torus can be thought of as a discross i with the trivial map that is fibered over the disk. And since these vibrations agree along the boundary, I can just kind of cap off my vibration and I get a yq as simply genus 2 surface in this picture, f hat cross i, and the gluing map we call phi hat the closed monodromy. And so that's very important here. This is special. We can do this whenever the knot Q is fibered. OK. Now an, another new term that I have to introduce that will be important for the proof is called the Cass and Gordon derivative. And so it's, it's simply a collection of curves contained in the fiber surface. Let me draw these. Oh, I got another color. Let's do blue. So before you go on, the, mm -hmm. the monodromy here is like a reducible for this particular case, it's yeah. not reducible. Not no. Finite order? Uh, no, no. The zero surgery is finite order. Yes. That's but the okay. yeah, 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 yeah. Yep. It's it's uh, order PQ. Yep. And it is reducible. Yes. Yeah. Sorry, I thought you meant for for the knot. Yep. Yeah. In this in the case of Q, TPQ connects some T minus PQ. Um, the, mono, the closed monodromy will have finite order. Yep. OK, so I pick some collection of curves that cut my surface up into a planar, planar surface. And now I can you know, reimagine those in this manifold y sub q. And the condition is that the induced map on the fundamental group preserves the, the subgroup generated by those curves. This will come into play later, but I think this is the best definition to give for now. Oh, I didn't give you the second part. So the second part is what I just said. If I let n be the subgroup of the fundamental group of the surface, normally generated by those curves, then, then it's preserved by the monodromy. What's happening in the background is that there's some handle body over which this monodromy is extending. But the handle body is not embedded in S3. And so I'm kind of sweeping that under the rug for now. 
Okay, so there are three steps, and if I'm being honest, each of these three steps could have its own hour-long talk. But I'm, I'm going to try to give you the, the high points. And so the first step is to take my link and, and augment it. I add an unlink and then I slide until I can replace k with this Cass and Gordon derivative. And so that uses some, some theory from Hegard splittings and thin position. The second step is to say, OK, now I'm going to tell you what every possible Cass and Gordon derivative is up to handle slides. And so if I can do one and two, then I know that it falls into one of those families. And then finally is to, to use some machinery developed by Gomf when he standardized the other examples to show that, in fact, that all of these Cass and Gordon derivatives give you standard S4s. And, and I'll remark that we, of course, you know, like when you prove anything, you try to prove it in as greatest generality as possible. And so the, the first step holds for every, every fiber knot Q, which is a component of an R link. You know, of course, we're trying to prove this for all knots, but we thought maybe it'd be really great to prove it for all fiber knots. We only got through step one for all fiber knots. The step two uses this fact that Nathan mentioned that the monodromy for this uh, connected sum of torus knots is reducible in a, in a very important, crucial way. And so our classification holds for all of these. And then, of course, we couldn't standardize all of them, but we could standardize these generalized square knots. <clears throat> so there's, there's a lot of work still to be done here. And I think it's, um, anyway, I'll save that for the end if there's time. OK, so let's, let's look at step one. What are the ingredients that go into here? Like, like I said, in this picture, there are many things I can say about a knot in YQ with a reducible surgery. Charlemagne and Thompson prove that we have this nice leveling property. I can always push the second knot into a closed fiber. And so this is my schematic of like the, the lines or surfaces. And I have an S1's worth of surfaces glued together. And that little red line is like my knot that I've pushed into a surface. And so to uh, realize the surgery, I can cut open along a copy of the fiber. And I get something homeomorphic to F cross I. And then I employ the surgery principle, which you might have seen if you've thought about like the Berge conjecture. This is how you justify that the knots in question in the Berge conjecture work. This is attaching three-dimensional two handles to each copy of my knot and then gluing the resulting boundary together. I won't say much more about that. But it's, it's more or less a, a standard construction if you think about surgery on knots on surfaces. And then so finally, I can just think of this as some sort of decomposition where these pieces are compression bodies. I just have a surface with a single three-dimensional handle glued on. These are their negative boundaries, and these are their positive boundaries. The relative thickness is like the indicative of the genus. So the negative boundaries are glued together, and the positive boundaries are glued together. And of course, the result of surgery, by assumption, is the three-manifold connected some two copies of S1 cross S2. And so this is called a circular Hegard splitting. The Hegard splitting, I take two handle bodies, glue them together along their boundary, or two compression bodies, glue them to their, with their positive boundaries. But in this case, I also glue the negative boundaries together. And if I'm careful, I can see that this can be arranged so that this map is the identity map, and this map is the closed monodromy map. Now, there's this really nice theorem from Charlemagne and Thompson regarding thin position and untelescoping of Hegard surfaces, namely, if I can say something about the negative boundary, then I can say something about what's happening along the positive boundary. So if the negative boundary is compressible, then I can take those, these, uh, these compressions. I can do something along the gluing of the positive boundary where I slide a handle past another handle. It's, it's called weakly reducible. OK, and, and this manifold is simple. I know what all the essential surfaces are. Namely, they are spheres. So if I see something that's not a sphere, I can conclude by the Charlemagne Thompson theorem that the positive boundary is weakly reducible. And I, and I do this process, essentially. I can imagine that this compression body is here. I have a handle here, and I, and I just push it past and bring it around. And what that gives me is another generalized Hegard splitting, the circular Hegard splitting, but I've reduced the complexity. The genus has gone down by 1. So you know, if I started and the genus of the thick surface was 3 and the genus here was 2, I would get genus 2 and genus 1. I iterate this process. I know I can keep going until the genus here is 0. And so I just keep taking this and kind of unwrapping it. I unwrap it and I unwrap it until I get this standard picture. And so the point is that I can re repeatedly do this process called untelescoping until I get 
what we call the standard circular Hegar decomposition. And at each step, well, the gluing map is no longer the monodromy because I'm gluing smaller genus surfaces to, but it, but it like restricts to the monodromy on some relevant subsurface. So it, the, the gluing map at each step is related to the monodromy in some very kind of essential way. And so here's, here's the, a very brief outline of the proof of the first part. The idea is that you keep unwrapping, but when I unwrap, I imagine that I've, that I've embedded some unlink around the, the, the two handle or the one handle here. So I have some compression that way, I have some compression that way, I'm going to imagine this one is fixed. I'm going to imagine this one is, is tightly coiled with a bunch of unknots. And now whenever I take this one and pass it around the circle, I'm going to leave behind a, like a trail of breadcrumbs. Every time I do this, I leave behind one of my unknots from an unlinked component. And at the end, what I end up seeing after you know, a lot more argument that's being suppressed is that my trail of breadcrumbs is in fact a Cass and Gordon derivative because I've kept, I've done some careful bookkeeping with the monodromy. Okay, that's, that's maybe what I want to say about that. I, I know that's not enough detail, but is that all right? Okay. Okay, so let's move on to step two. Step two is classifying Cass and Gordon derivatives. And I want to make sure I do this because the, the picture is really quite beautiful with the topology here. It's really simple, in fact. So, this is a fibered knot. The genus of the fiber is given by that expression. And there's this classical construction of a ciphered surface where you imagine your torus not sitting on a Hagar torus for S3. And now you have, uh, you know, P meridian disks for this kind of inner solid torus and Q meridian disks for another solid torus that's winding around. And now these are attached together with PQ bands. I, I could make this simpler. This isn't coming from any, it's not like a ciphered algorithm picture, but I really like this topologically because you can see the vibration. It's, you, you have that, there's, there's rotation in each of those two solid tori. So these disks will be permuted by the monodromy. They're going to cycle around a solid torus on the inside. And these disks will pinwheel around this way, and then the bands are cyclically permuted. If, you, if you've ever gone on Ken Baker's sketches of topology blog, there's a really wonderful gif of this process in motion. Okay, so now we've, we've taken this picture and, and we're trying to use a description of the monodromy that um, Marty Charlemagne wrote down for the, the regular square knot. So I, I embed a graph by putting a vertex at each disk and edges through each band. And if I cut along this graph, I get this thing that looks like an annulus with some gluing instructions along the boundary. So this is my, this is T43. And the knot in question is the connect sum of T43 with T minus 43. And so if I take two copies of that, this is what you see on the, on the far right. Whoops. So to get a, a picture of the ciphered surface for T43, I, I just flip this, I reflect it over there, and I glue them together, and I glue them together along an annulus instead of the entire torus. And this is a picture of the ciphered surface for this knot with P equals 4 and Q equals 3. And then there's still some identifications on the boundary? Yes, the identifications on the outside uh, are, are given by these little indices. So for instance, here's a little arc with boundaries on the knot. It meets the graph once. That arc starts here on the knot, passes through this edge, which is identified there, and is glued to that. And then the, you kind of mirror the identifications on the inside boundary. Okay, and so what is the monodromy? Well, the, mono the reason to draw this picture is that the monodromy is very simple now. It's just a one over PQ clockwise rotation. Because if you track what's happening, well, you can just keep track of what all the edges map to and, and carefully see that the monodromy preserves the boundary of this annulus, and so then it's just some rotation of the annulus. And it, you know, I, I'm really glossing over a detail here because I told you that the monodromy should be fixed on the boundary. Turns out that detail doesn't matter when we do the zero surgery. And so I, I like this monodromy better because it, it preserves the ciphered vibration of this space. OK, and, and a, little, a little detail here is that when I do the rotation, I do want to preserve the boundary of Q. And so I have to drag it back. The, the rotation takes it here, but I want this to be the identity. And so I pull it back. And so some of these arcs map to nice arcs, but some of them map to arcs that get dragged across other arcs. And so the monodromy for the knot is not periodic, but once I do the zero surgery, 
this becomes periodic because it doesn't matter where that hole is anymore. So the, the closed monodromy is truly periodic. And in fact, this is a seifert fibered space. It has a really nice base space. It's S2 with four exceptional points. Each, uh, each pair of PQ exceptional points is coming from one of the two sum ends. And this is called a horizontal surface. It's transverse to every fiber. <clears throat> and then the, the, the monodromy, in fact, preserves the ciphered fibers. Uh, it, uh, it rotates regular fibers by 1 over PQ. It just goes a 1 over PQ click along them, and then does this to the exceptional fibers. OK. Now, where did these Cass and Gordon derivatives come from? Well, if you believe what I just said, it tells you that the covering map from the surface to the base space is equivariant with respect to the monodromy. And so I can pick my favorite curve on this pillowcase and lift it to a bunch of curves on the ciphered surface. So those, those curves are parameterized by the extended rational numbers. And in some cases, I lift to a single curve, like with this 1 over 0 curve, that lifts to that single red curve. But the 0 over 1 curve lifts to 12 distinct curves in the ciphered surface. By the way, they're permuted by the monodromy, and so it's trivial to check that this condition of the, the induced map preserving the, this fundamental group is satisfied. And so that's, that's basically it. These are all the Cass and Gordon derivatives. So there's a picture when uh, so there's something that's special that happens when p equals 2. I'm, I'm going to run out of time, so I'm just going to gloss over this. <coughs> And so the lemma is that this is a Cass and Gordon derivative. And the proof is what I just said, that the monodromy preserves the fundamental group, the, the subgroup of the fundamental group. So there's, there's a huge piece of the puzzle, which I haven't told you yet, which is why an arbitrary Cass and Gordon derivative has to be one of these. Well, I mentioned before that this, uh, what, what it means to, this is what it means to extend over a handle body. And um, the, the operative theorem is that if I have a Cass and Gordon derivative, then in fact the closed monodromy extends over the handle body. This, this n is precisely the kernel of the inclusion map. So n is equal to the kernel of the inclusion map of the surface, I guess it's f hat here, into the handle body. And so Cass and Gordon showed that this kind of algebraic condition is equivalent to the geometric condition. Uh, if, if a knot has a cast and Gordon, if a fiber knot has a cast and Gordon derivative, then it is homotopy riven. Yeah, it's, it's true if and only if it's homotopy riven. Yeah, I've, I've totally suppressed that from the talk, but yes. Yep. All right, so now we get to invoke equivariant Dane's lemma, which tells me that if I have a finite group acting on a three manifold, in this case my handle body, then I get this nice collection of disks, which are legitimately permuted by the monodromy. So this tells us that if I have any Cass and Gordon derivative, it must be handle slide equivalent to a really nice Cass and Gordon derivative permuted by the monodromy. And then I do just a little bit of covering space theory, and I can conclude that it must be one of these, um, one of these things that I've generated by just lifting curves from the pillowcase. So I will run out of time, and I think it, it won't, won't be very fun to talk about the third step. But here's the recap of the first two steps. So I start with my R-link. I promote it until I get a Cass and Gordon derivative. And then I tell you what a bunch of Cass and Gordon derivatives are. And then I, I prove that, that every possible Cass and Gordon derivative is handle slide equivalent to one of these row inverses of lambda sub a over b's. And so the final step is to standardize these in the special case. And you have to do what's called the um, Gomps torus trick. But I'm going to skip over that. The pictures are nice, so you can look at the picture. You find some torus, you twist along the tori, and then you use this nice big machine that Gomp developed to tell you that, in fact, if I twist along the right torus, then I've done some sort of weak equivalence move. And so this is like, I talked to Gomp once, and he said, yeah, this is the only trick. This is it. This is how you standardize everything. And as far as I know, he's right. He <laughs> said it all boils down to this trick. So anyway, let's see. Before the bell, I'm worried about this bell. So there's the main theorem again. This is, uh, if, I if you hand me any two-component link, doesn't matter what k is, but the parent knot is this connected sum of tp2, t minus p2, 
then the four manifold I get is standard S4. And, and of course, I would like to further extend this classification to more, more general results. We have some ideas how to do this, but nothing has been successful so far. All right, thank you. Uh, are there any questions for Alex? So, so what's left to polish off the smoothie? <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> what's left? Well. This, this would, you know, if, if what I just wrote on there all succeeded, that would prove it for two component links with a fibered component. So, you know, in my opinion, but what I'm really worried about is this GSC, smooth four-dimensional point cray. I'm not even thinking about one handles whatsoever. I just want to think about two and three handles. And, and so in that case, one thing that would be really nice to have would be some sort of Cass and Gordon criterion for non-fibered homotopy ribbon knots. So the way I think about this, you have this, uh, you have this fibered knot, you have this nice decomposition, and somehow you can, you can fill it in four-dimensionally with these handle bodies. There's, there's much more going on than I described, that the, if you have a fibered homotopy ribbon knot, Cass and Gordon tells you that you can kind of like fill out um, a homotopy four ball with some handle body fibration. And so in the case of the non-fibered knots, you might want to take, instead of a fibration, like a circular Haggard splitting, in three dimensions and then fill out that circular Haggard splitting with, with handle bodies at every st step of the way. And perhaps you can fill out the four ball in a similar way. And, and if, if there was a way to do that, then that might be a way forward beyond just fiber knots. But yes, there's, the, the, the smooth four-dimensional point Cray conjecture is epsilon percent done at this point. <laughs> um, so uh, so, so your uh, theorem standardizes I mean, all these famous examples going back to, to the 70s. I mean, are there now, are, are there other ones that, I mean, are, are we out of potential <laughs> examples to the four-dimensional point break conjecture, or? Uh, we are not out. We are not. So for instance, you know, my, my collaborator claims this more strongly than I would. You know, Jeff says, well, we can't standardize any of the, uh, these other ones. And so these are all now new potential counterexamples to the smooth four-dimensional point break conjecture. Right? With, with a different parent, with you know, parent Q43 or Q57 or whatever, we, we generate a huge family of stuff. And we have no idea how to standardize it. The tricks just don't work. The tori aren't right. We can do torus twists, but they don't satisfy um, the, the hypotheses of, of Gomp's machine. So there are those. Um, there's also, you know, there's this Glock twisting construction in S4, and there was a, a proof claimed about that. And I'm, I'm not sure what the status of of that is that may or may not still be open, and what so you. Is that standard? Yes, yeah. So it's known that if you do a Gluck twist on a surface in S4, you always get a homotopy S4, and this has been standardized for many cases. There was a proof this summer, a paper on the archive that claimed a general proof, and I think it's I, I don't know what the status is. Yeah, since I'm on tape. <laughs> Are there any uh, other questions? Uh, if not, let's thank Alex.